Hello and welcome to the Prospect Blueprint. This webcast is for prospects, coaches, and those who support those prospects so they best understand what it takes to go from one level to another, what to embrace and what to avoid, and get to whatever that next level might be. I'm Kelly Kleiman and my battery mate, as always, is Mr. Rick Dempsey, 24-year MLB vet and fan favorite with the Twinkies, the Twins, the Yankees, the Orioles, the Brewers, and the Cleveland Indians, and the Dodgers, and in 1983, of course, the World Series MVP for the Baltimore Orioles. Hi, Rick. Thank you. Uh, how are you? <laughs> always, always good. Good to be with you. Actually, two weeks in a row, we had a little bit of a break there, so it's great to be back on. Today's guest is someone we've been chasing down for quite some time. Been trying to sync up with this guy for several months, and finally, we've been able to corner him. So, for, for you prospects looking to find out what a pro scout is looking for in a player, Here's Jim Stevenson, an area scout for the world champion Houston Astros, who has also scouted for the Brewers and the Indians. He has a knack for finding players in every nook and cranny, and, and including Canada. And we're excited to get his insights because right now it is a confusing mess out there for prospects who have no idea what the future holds. And that's because of the, the, the portal. That's because of the changes in the minor league system, so on and so forth. I now hand over the microphone, batting in the number one position as usual, Mr. Rick Dempsey. Uh, first of all, Jimmy, welcome to the show. Congratulations on that World Series ring you're going to be getting. Uh, that's going to be pretty special. Uh, man, I, I want to get into your brain and find out how the Houston Astros have managed to, to be such a strong ball club the last few years in Major League Baseball. But let's go back. I know, I know that... Uh, you uh, have been around for almost three decades now scouting, but what has the differences been between uh, when you first came in the scouting and the current situation? Now you guys get good players, although there's not as many drafts around anymore. You know, a few drafts at, at all. Everything has changed. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Rick and Kelly. I sure appreciate it. I'm uh, very honored to be on your show. Um, that's a great question. Uh, because, you know, it's I started my first year was in the 93 draft with the Indians. So uh, I was out of baseball for, oh, this is my 25th. I just finished. So I, I was out for about three years after the between the Indians and the Brewers. And uh, so there's been a lot of change, obviously, as you know, from, you know, the drafts back in 93 to where we're at now, where we were drafting guys back there till you got tired of drafting them. We, you know, teams had quit out of about 100, 110. Uh, sometimes, and there'd be 50 guys were drafting and follow guys to go into JUCOs. And um, then it got cut back to about 50 rounds somewhere in the early 2000s. And then we narrowed it back down to 40 rounds. And now we're, we're to 20 rounds and we're every organization's down two clubs. So space is limited. And, uh, you know, so we don't have as much uh, room um, to really dig as deep as I, you know, I would like to as an area scout, go get guys. I mean, I've had more success probably after the 20th round than before it, you know. So um, now we'll, we'll still sign a few free agents here and there after the draft, uh, some college guys. Uh, I think it's a maximum of 20 or 25K, whatever they get. But uh, we sign four or five of those guys every year. So, yeah, a lot's changed uh, from the from – when I started to now, absolutely. Yeah, you know, uh, now what do you look for in players uh, performance-wise? Uh, I know that you, how deep do you get into it? This is where a lot of things have changed. The way that you're you're actually trying to check up on a guy on how well he's doing on social media, you know, and, uh, all those yeah. kind of things. How deep do you actually go in order to get the kind of players that you get? With uh, well. That's an interesting question, and uh, it, it's it's more involved now than it ever was. You know, uh, it was never we never dug too deep into the background. You, you more or less laid in the weeds on guys, you know, and you didn't want any other scouts to know you were on guys, so you uh, you played it close to the vest. And now the information world we're living in now, you know, everybody's under a, a microscope, so we get so much information. Um, from off the field, on the field, at the stadium, what these kids, you know, all the measurements and the analytics and all that stuff too. So we have almost too much information, it seems now than before, where 
you just basically went off your gut feel and your trust and and what you saw when you were at the stadium and had a chance maybe to visit with the kid after. You know, now it's Zoom meetings and calls and the GM wants on them and the scouting directors and very in-depth now, you know. Yeah. Well, we did mention finding players in all the nooks and crannies, including Canada, which you could yeah. work that into the conversation for sure. But with the advent of the portal, a lot of high quality players are spilling over into D2 and even D3 just to keep their game going. Do you now look at those divisions or will you look at those divisions a little bit more carefully um, as being a slightly bit more target rich environment than say in previous years, at least for position players? Uh, well, that's a good question. I, um, I try to on a personal level, but now when we're down to 20 rounds, you know, I, I think a lot of those guys are losing an opportunity now. They're, you know, they're overlooked. We don't have the information on these guys, like the D2s, the AIs. They don't have the, the track man units at their stadium. So we don't have that kind of data to support what uh, the scout might see and put in his report so uh it's it's there's a double-edged sword there so you really have to uh trust your instincts trust to what you see and you better sell them pretty good in the in the room you know so it's a lot tougher sell on those guys even though we've been successful you know we had two that played on in the world series on the roster uh hensley and mccormick were both you know uh thousand dollars senior signs late round picks so uh, we're going to still keep shopping there. I, I, I hope and expect, I hope the industry does, but I think losing those 20 rounds from 40 to 20 is, is going to hurt those guys, you know, but um, with the portal being what it is now, a lot of these guys are getting kicked back to the D twos now. So I think it's going to raise the quality of play there where they may get better players and, and obviously a, a place that we're going to continue to look. Kind of staying on that theme, but going into the JUCO end of it now because of the situation. I mean, it, it seems as though JUCOs are a huge beneficiary of the portal. And even to some extent, COVID has helped drive a high school, at least a couple high school classes, you know, into JC development um, or primarily redshirted guys from, let's say, 20 who didn't get to see action because of bloated COVID um, rosters. Um, do you think the next couple of years might be especially strong for Juco signees, in your opinion. It, it seems as though because there's so much movement in D1 baseball that that, that it seems like it would be a, rich, a relatively smart uh, breeding ground uh, because so many of them can't go anywhere because everyone's pulling guys out of other D1s that went into the portal. Yeah, no, no, that's a good point, I, Anna. You know, I see it a lot of these big D1s where they have, you know, 40 guys and on their on their team in the fall workouts and 25-man pitching, you know, guys going out to pitch in the fall. And uh, so a lot of those guys are getting kicked back, I believe. And I, and I think if they leave at semester, the JUCO option is really one of their only options. So absolutely, uh, I, I think it'll improve the quality of baseball. Yeah. Lost the audio. We lost your audio. Oh, you did? Yeah, now you're good. You're back. How strange oh. is that? Um, I'll, ask, the I'll ask the question again. I'll just be real brief with it, though. Okay. So JUCO seems to be a huge beneficiary of the portal, to, to even to some extent, at least, because COVID has helped drive a high school class or two, and I know at least a class of 20, some of the class of 20 of 19 into JC development mode, primarily red shirt guys when the rosters were expanded uh, due to COVID. Um, are the next couple of years especially strong for JUCO signees in your opinion? And then you did mention that you only signed four or five guys. Is that actually a limit or are you allowed to sign as many as you want? No, to answer your, uh, that question there, no, we, we are not limited. After the twentieth round, you can sign as many players as you want for, I think it's twenty k or twenty five k. Um, in twenty twenty, after the draft, I think we did ten when it was only the five round draft. I think last year we did two in twenty twenty two. So yeah, there's no limit. You can sign as many as you want. It doesn't matter, and which is good because uh, I think it really helps. Uh, you know, it, it 
it, it takes it takes 10 really good ones to have, to have one good one, you know, almost. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I'd rather take my chances and, and sign 10 arms or guys we really uh, liked and, and give them an opportunity and get them out there. Um, and I hope Major League Baseball, I hope all the teams do it, to be honest with you. I mean, I think uh, that's the way it should be. Um, uh, we, But they have limits. You know, you can only sign so many players, like 150 players in your system or something like that in the U.S. So there are some limits also. So And every time you sign somebody, you have to release somebody basically too. So, um, you know, it's a, it's kind of a catch-22 there also. You may want to give a guy another year of, of – uh, of um you know getting better or you you may want to get rid of a guy so it's there's a cost to add another player um, yeah no the i think the ju i think it's a definite benefit now for the juco uh, programs because uh there, you know there's the d1s are, are so full of players and you know that i think there's a thousand still in the portal if i'm not mistaken still looking for a place to play now i don't know what eligibility years they are but um you know, they're even stacked uh, with the freshmen and the sophomores. And, and kids want to play, and kids need to play. They need to be on the field getting innings and A-Bs. A- and, uh, I mean, it's it's a great opportunity. To s- you can still go back and do D1 at a different time. But uh, I think if kids don't seem like they, they have an opportunity there in the near future, you know, going the JUCO route is definitely a, an option that um, gives kids innings and at-bats that they need. Okay, well, all right. So we got we got Jimmy can hear me good. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm talking good, about so. the uh, talking about the players, Jimmy. Um, who are some of the best discoveries that you've made, and some of them that have got away? I mean, every scout has that one guy yeah. that they loved, but <laughs> someone else beat him to the punch. I'm sure that's happened to you. You've been around it. You've been around it for so darn long. But throw some names out there. I, I like to hear about the guys that that you've signed that have really done well. Well, I'll. Um- I'll, I, I got a good list of guys that I've signed and um, I've been blessed to, and fortunate to have the opportunity to sign and get to know some of these kids. But if you want to talk about the guys, first of all, that, you know, they got away or I didn't get in the boat, you know, um, uh, I, I would say the, the two stand out because I drafted a Jake Arietta out of junior college and wow, in like the yeah. 16th or 17th round, and he, uh, he, so he was a freshman. I believe yeah, he was a freshman. Took him in the 16th, 17th round, and he won about 150000 So I had him pitch in a summer league game for the McKinney Marshals f- for their scouting director to come see. And it was about 110 that day. It was 10 or 11 in the morning, the game. And I thought he threw really well. And it turns out we didn't get the – I, I didn't get the money I wanted to sign him. And he went on to TCU and got a million dollars in the fifth round two years later and, you know, ended up winning a, a Cy Young, obviously. So that was a tough one to swallow. The other one who I really thought I was going to get was, uh, um, oh, gosh, was, uh, um, oh, the kid out of Little Rock that pitched for the Pirates and the Yankees forever. Um uh, I just drew a blank. It'll hit me in a second, but um, um, probably the, the some of the best kids I've had, you know, was obviously Keiko had the most success, I believe. You know, he won a Cy Young. He's a Tulsa kid. Went to University of Arkansas and Dallas. Pitched well for us for several several years. Um, uh, Giovanni Gallardo with Milwaukee Brewers had a good career. Um. Uh, Gallardo Keiko. Um, whew. oh, uh, I took a kid out of Juco, Ramon Laureano, who we traded to Oakland, the center fielder over there, who's who uh burst onto the scene there a couple of years back with the big arm and throwing guys out. Um, Josh James, a kid who pitched out of the pen for us, uh, in, in 19, had a good run, he's been injury riddled since, you know, had a big arm. A kid named Abraham Toro, another Juco guy who we traded to Seattle, and Seattle moved him now to uh, uh, Cleveland, maybe it was. I can't remember who they they moved him for now. Um, Adrian Hauser with the Brewers. Um, And then some under-the-radar guys, you know, that were unheralded, the Jack Mayfields of the world. And, uh, oh, 
uh, my first guy I ever signed, kid named Mike Bassick. You may remember his dad, Mike DeBassick, uh, who pitched in the big leagues also mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for a while. Um, Dana Evelyn, the kid from uh, – he was from California, went to Juco out here in Texas. So I- I've, I've had a, a pretty good run. So, well, I'll yeah. tell you what, that, that Jake Arrieta, I-, I watched him pitch every game he pitched for the Orioles, and I was heartbroken and really kind of angry when they decided to get rid of him to the Cub. You know, oh, yeah. everybody was so worried about him throwing across his body. I've caught guys like that before, you know, and, and they've been pretty effective. You just have to learn how to deal with it, you know. Sometimes move him across on the on the pitcher's mound so that it frees up the outside corner to right-handers a little bit more. But, man, oh, man, I, I was so disappointed when we traded Jake Arietta, a young pitcher, that young, and had that much good stuff uh, because he, he, he would miss uh, the strike zone. He just wasn't really – totally in command of all of his pitches yet, but that guy had a lot of promise. He proved it for the Cubs and the Orioles just blew a big opportunity to have a big name pitcher in the middle of that rotation that they were looking for. And they blew it. Did the same thing with Bundy and a few others do. Uh, But my God, what a pick that really was. That's good scouting. If you saw a lot in that. (laughs) Yeah. He was awesome. Yeah. He was a he, he the body the arm the makeup the, his you yeah. know he he got his outs in the zone he 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 attacked the zone I mean it was a sinker slider attack when he was in junior college and you just knew this kid was going to flourish you know I mean it it was a no brainer I thought and it's just uh, a matter of time slowing him down a little bit in the delivery and get and get that release point out of him which was my forte as a catcher but the, the most important part of the delivery is the release point. Forget everything else. I don't care if he throws across his body. I knew how nasty he'd be. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's good to hear. Yeah, that's good yeah. stuff. Anyway, yeah. um, okay. Well, you, you know, when you're out there looking for players, uh, are you given a list of the uh, of of the talent that you're looking for, uh, or the best? Or do you guys just sign the best guys that are available at the time? Um, you mean a list of who to go see, you mean? or Yeah, the, yeah you know, like you, they say, well, we want definite starting pitchers. We don't want guys out of the bullpen. We want a shortstop. We want a center fielder. You build your club up the middle, so you're looking for those kind of guys. So, I mean, how yeah. do they do it with the Houston Astros and specifically with you? Uh, uh, you know what? We are free to to see and write up and put on our prep list any yeah. players that we like. But that being said, we're also given a target list of the guys at the top. And everyone knows who they are, you know. Yeah. And uh, and we dig pretty deep on those guys and try to do as much as we can, gathering information and, and scout looks and uh, and get all the data and all that information. Um, but there's no uh, uh, formula that we use where it's, hey, we're just going for uh, – um, uh, pitchers or, you know, we don't even draft many left-handed pitchers, which is kind of surprising. You'd think, hey, it's left-handed, but, you know, these guys that we have now, um, we, a lot of these righties they feel can get left-handers out also. I'm not a big a proponent of that because I think out of the pen, those guys are really useful. And there's nothing like mixing in a left-handed starter in the middle of your of your series also. I mean, I, I'm a proponent, but uh, baseball's kind of, uh, you know, shifted a little bit with um, – you know, yeah. the importance of, of left-handed starters. So uh, with position guys, uh, you know, we're looking for athletes. We're looking for guys who move really well. Um, you know, good baseball ball IQ. Uh, we feel that guys who hit have an opportunity to hit for power down the road. The power doesn't have to be there first. Um, and I'm a believer in that. These guys get their man strength in their mid-20s and uh, you know, and now all the showcases are raw power and exit view. I, I want to see guys with high bat to ball, uh, uh, bat to ball skills and uh, the ability to use the field foul pole to foul pole. And uh, the power is going to come. You've probably seen it, you know, year after year yeah. over your entire career. Oh, I have. Yeah. It seems like more scouts are, are looking for power right away than they are actually looking for developing good hitters to have power. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Hitting's the hardest part, you know. Yeah, it, hitting it out isn't. I don't believe, you know. So it's just like you know, the guy we got 
over there Bregman at third base. He just gets them over that yellow line in the Crawford boxes. You know, he doesn't have to hit them 400 <laughs> feet. So. Yeah. yeah, we love him. By the way, we also love Michael Brantley on that squad. Oh, yeah. my, my kids are gigantic uh, uh, Jose Altuve fans for, for reasons. But what are some of the showcases or events that you go to, and, and how do you get tips on players? How Do, do coaches <clears throat> say, hey, you, you got to stop by. I've got this kid. We recruited this kid. He's, he's lights out or do they try to hide him from you too? Because they want him for all four years. Oh yeah. We, you know, I mean, we know who these kids are now since yeah. they're 14 years old. It's, it's, it's crazy. You never knew back when I started who the guy was till the spring, you know, that year when you went out, uh, uh, you know, start watching guys. I mean, I don't think anyone heard of Kerry Wood till he, you know, went out there for his first start that spring at high school. Mm -hmm. So, our senior year. Um, now we know all these kids and who they are. Uh, it's, it's tough to hide them. Um, uh, and what was the rest of that question? I'm sorry, Kelly. Well, you know, how do you get tips on them? You know, oh, yeah. 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 Now, um, most of the kids, it's like we have a designed area as an area scout. So right. it's up to you to find out and make sure you know if there's some guy down there at Western Junior College in Altus, Oklahoma, that you need to see. Uh, you better reach out to all these guys and the coaching staffs and, but you do get tips along the way and, and scouts share, share information more now than they ever have. You know, uh, there's no secrets anymore. It seems. And, um, you know, I still, I still, I don't want to call it old school, but I still, you know, keep them close to the vest and do my own work. And, uh, you know, because I enjoy the competition still trying to get that guy later in the draft and, uh, you know, it only takes one to find out about them before everybody knows sometimes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you do your, you do your own work. You make your own phone calls and, uh, and know your area, you know, know who's in it. And I noticed that you're on Twitter because virtually everybody that, well, we don't, we don't really push for a big following. We're more into the video views. Uh, uh -huh. but, but those that we bring on the show off times have a lot of followers. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter Beatty had a lot of followers. We, we have a lot yeah. of those guys out there. You follow everybody. Is this what yeah. you do in your research just to sort of take a look at what's going on? Keep yourself. Uh, you know, and I, I appreciate you mentioning that because Kelly, you know what? It was never my plan. You know, I started following kids and all of a sudden, if you put Houston Astros scout on there, you know, if it pops up, boom, hey, everyone wants to follow. Because I wish I was playing when I was a kid that, you know, scouts were that accessible uh, where you just have to tap and hit follow. And next thing you know, you're, I could shoot them videos all night long, which kids do, you know. But yeah. uh, I started kind of getting engaged a little bit more with the kids in the off season, And I put out things, hey, guys, open up. Let's send me all your videos. And next thing you know, I have 800 videos or – uh, you know, showing up and I go through some of these and I'll be honest with you. We did find a couple of kids who we signed off of, uh, for Twitter, you know, who shot me videos. We had our scouts go see the guys, you know? So um, it was more, and I'm up to, I don't know, 18,000, something like that, that I follow and probably follow backs. But if, so if you play and you put a glove on and you're in, in college, high school, junior college, I'll follow you back yeah. or a coach. So I've just kind of had fun with it. I don't tweet a whole lot, but, when I do, I try to say something that's positive. And, you know, I think we all have a, a, a um, uh, we all owe the game something. You know what I mean? I, I don't like just to shut it down at the end of the day. You know, I still want kids to have the opportunity to be, to be accessible to them. And, uh, and I think kids enjoy it also that, hey, there's a scout that wants to see my, see my videos. And I have no problem. I sit and watch those for hours sometimes. So, yeah. That's I, nice. I, I, yeah. I say thank you for all the prospects out there who, uh, who 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 take the time to send you their material and you actually look at it because I don't think you probably look at more video than some of the uh, college coach recruiters out there. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, and, and that's it's funny you say that because a lot of these kids, you know, I see some interesting stuff and uh, and I know it's just video, but, you know. I have jotted down a few kids and gone and seen them and thought, golly, this kid's pretty good. but He's not ready for me. But he, you know, this kid can help with D1. And I'll make those phone calls for these kids, you know, and tell a coach at this junior college or this D1, hey, you need to go see this guy or that guy. I, I, I'll do anything to help kids if, if they uh, – if, 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 if I think they can help a program, I'll definitely let somebody know. So uh, – and I enjoy it, you know, so. Kind of like Rick, 
you know, Rick is amazing with kids. You know, Rick and I, you know, did a clinic not so long ago, and he's a hard guy to pull out of those things. You know, he'll see some kids out there playing catch, you know, the off season <laughs> up at the ball field, and he'll say, see you later, Cal. And he's walking, <laughs> having conversations. This guy is an amazing individual. I'm very honored to work with Rick. Anyway, Rick, you're up. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> being that I've had a few years of experience as a catcher, I've always, I always got to finish it up by asking, uh, you know, what, what do you look for in a catching prospect today? Is it all about the technique or the way they set up behind home plate, the metrics, you know, what actually do you look for in a major league, who, who you think is going to be a, a good major league catcher these days? Yeah. I, and that's, that's the million dollar question because they come in so many different shapes, sizes, and abilities, whether it's a, a defense first guy or an offensive guy or a glove guy um, first. Uh, you know, I see them go off the board early in the first round for their bat, and then they get in the minor leagues, Rick, and they move them to first base. So it's it's one after another. You know, I've, I just oh, keep seeing this. So – Obviously, they probably weren't a very good athlete back there, or they don't move well, or uh, you know, just it's 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 the hardest position, absolutely, to play on the field. But I think, secondly, it's the hardest position to evaluate, also from a scout standpoint. You know, because um, the, the number one thing everyone looks for is the ooh, the arm strength. But no, you got to catch the ball before anything else happens. So you have to all the things that come before throwing are now. And, and base stealing isn't that big of a part of the game as it was when you were playing. Um, so I'll take less arm strength and a better defensive catcher. <laughs> Absolutely. As you, as you see, look at the guy we have back there. I know he can really throw, but Maldonado, there's nobody better with a pitching staff, I don't think, right now in Major League Baseball than him. He gets the most out of everybody on that staff from the, from the first starter to the glass guy out of the bullpen, you know, and the guy who closes the games for us. So that's what I'd like to see is those guys who are really engaged. They, they do a good job handling a pitching staff. You have 15 different mentalities and 15 different guys stuff that you have to be able to catch and you got to catch it. You know, uh, I can't stand when guys drop the baseball or, um, you know, it's, they don't take pride in their work back there. That's what I want to see a guy with who plays with energy, good tempo, um, he cares, he's passionate and he'll get in the, he'll get in the pitcher's ass if he needs to also. So, uh, those, but it's, you know, those kind of things you, you grow to become also, but when you're in college, you better be able to show me those skills, yeah. you know, um, but uh, there's all kinds of guys with the average major league, what we call a 50 in the major leagues, 50 arm, but they're tremendous defenders back there. And, and the pitching staff, they got to be able to handle the pitching staff. Uh, well, Maldi hit, what, 200, 170, and he got two World Series and two American League championships with him. So, <laughs> You know, I, 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 you hit home with me with a lot of things that you just said about what you look for, you know. But, um, of course, uh, Maldonado does well uh, with the Houston Astros. But overall, yeah. uh, all of my years of watching it, it's the it's probably the weakest position in the major leagues today for me, because what I have how I evaluate you know he's obviously a good a, a good you can read pitchers well and you've got to be able to read hitters well. And I go back to the the Oakland A's in 1988 when Kurt Gibson hit the big famous home run in the first game and then we never saw him again. But I was worried when I got in catching that series because we were up against the most powerful team in World Series history on paper and, and the best offensive team all around. And we were the weakest team. But they made it the easiest series for me to call pitches because of the way they approached every at-bat. They, they would come up the first at-bat with a big wide-open stance. I knew where they wanted to get their hands to. In the middle of the of the bat, the hitting row was right down the middle of the middle end. And then they'd come up pigeon-toed, and it was easy to see. They're trying to keep the left shoulder in. They're looking to get that pitch on the outside half of the plate and drive it out of the ballpark. You know, so it would, that's when we would just turn everybody around and start pitching them in. We'd push them, try to get them to back open up again, give up the outside half. But 
you got to need you need a lot of years of experience and 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 that's yeah. probably what Maldon now I won't say that I've seen him catch a lot of games I just can't stand it when kid when the pitchers and the catchers excuse me go to that one knee and in a two strike situation or men on base or men in a in a stealing situation and they let the ball get by them and it yeah. just drives me nuts because that was a lot of my defense and how I I took the pressure off the pitcher because we didn't have as many people in scoring position to worry about anymore. And let me real quick just say I go back to Steve Stone. I don't maybe you remember that name. Oh yeah. When he, when he became an Oriole, you know he never won more than twelve games in his life. And the first game he's got a one run lead, men on second, and third, two outs in the ninth inning. He's pitching a hell of a good ball game and a two strikes on the hit, a right hand hitter, and nobody out. And I said, listen. I want you to throw this curveball in the dirt. He goes, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. And let them get the tying run uh, all the club plate with the winning run at third base. I said, listen, pal, you don't throw good enough to throw the ball by me. So you throw the curveball in the dirt. I promise you he's going to swing at it. And we're going to get you out of this inning, and you're going to win this ball game. He threw the curveball in the dirt. He says, this is your fault if it gets by. He had blocked it. The guy swung at it, two down, pop up. He wins his first game. He goes on to win 25 games and gets a Cy Young Award. 25 and seven, never won more than 12 games in his life. But those are the kind of things that, that I miss about the game. The way the catchers, you talk about Maldonado working with that pitching staff and how I had to work with my pitching staff to get as far as I did and playing in three World Series and eight divisional titles and all that baloney. But you know, it, it truly works when you have a catcher who can control the ball game for the organization. Yeah, that's that's a tremendous story right there, and uh, and it's refreshing to hear that you, to hear it uh, the way you you put it um, so well. Uh, it's half it's that undecided half of the room says this, and half the new idea of catching is the opposite. You know. Uh, Losing a run because a ball wasn't blocked. I mean, it's inexcusable almost. It wasn't when when I was started scouting, yeah. and now it's kind of like uh, it's not just okay, but we're 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 allowing that room for error, which was never allowed before. Yeah, um, you're right, and I think it's it's the catcher's job, like you said, like you told the guy, Steve. I will. Don't worry, just throw it. I'll take care of it on my end. And yeah. that's, you don't see that much anymore, you know? Um, They're more worried about the offense. You absolutely. Know, you got a catcher back there that can hit you uh, uh, 15 to 25 home runs, and they really don't care about the, the really intricate parts of the game and how you get a pitcher through a very tough inning and what pitches to call. You know, <laughs> I ask yeah. a lot of guys, uh, you know, what's a pitch that a right-hander to a right-hander never looks for, for um, uh, in a two-strike situation? And they can't they can't tell me. Well, I'll tell you. Is the breaking ball right at you? Is it, it's the only way you're going to get the hitter to jump back from home plate and give up the inside corner. I did it 20, 30 times in the course of my career. You get that strikeout now to get the two outs and then the third one, you know, as a ground ball or a fly ball that would have been a sacrifice fly or something, and you're out of the game. But little things like that, you only use it once in a while, yeah. but it's a pitch that you, as a right-hand hitter, never look for is the breaking ball on the inside corner from a right-hander in tough game situations. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, Rick, Rick, Rick is looking for an offer. That's his face reality. <laughs> Rick's ready to get back. Can you tell? <laughs> oh, my God. He probably could do oh. it, I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, no, it's great. I love the passion. He's I've amazing. written a book on it. I tell you, I've written a small book on on catching and defense and, and game situations and all that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, I'm afraid to distribute it because they probably laugh at me if they try to listen to what I had to go through the last 27 years in professional baseball, 24 of them in the big leagues, what I did and how I conditioned myself and how I never got hurt. You know, I was on the disabled list two times in 27 years, but both times it was with broken bones. You know, Don Gullett threw at me and Bo Jackson ripped me at home plate. So uh, other than that, I never had a sore arm, never had pulled muscles and all that kind of stuff. 
And I would like to be able to talk to players and let them know really what to look for at the major league level. If you want to make this a career, then you got to treat it like it's it's a, a, a career where you can make millions and millions of dollars now. So I I went off on my own, and I'm sorry. No, <laughs> Rick, I, I enjoyed it. It was good. That's great stuff. Uh, I agree 100 um, yeah. percent with everything you said. That was good stuff. Uh, you know, the, I'd love to see the book come out. Yeah, I think you need to finish well, it. Huh? I'll tell you what I will do. I will send you uh, the little pamphlet that I have on it. I'll get your Good. address and I'll send you that pamphlet. And it'd be fun just to read through it because it gets, it also gets into teaching all the five fa facets of the game, you know, uh, yeah. how to, yeah. how to throw block, receive, uh, how to field your position, which some of them very rarely know how to do and how to call a ball game. It's pretty yeah. interesting when I've caught 16 Cy Young Award winners during the <laughs> course of my career, and I've learned a lot from those guys. That's... I've learned a lot from them. And then I've showed them a few tricks of the trade myself. You're, you almost don't even see the pickoff plays anymore. I have at least uh, three or four times in my career picked a runner off a second base with the bases loaded. You'll never, ever see that in the game. No. Now, never. Never. <laughs> and I've done it before because I, I talked to my shortstop and I said things to him. I said, listen, you know, if if you see that guy break, you give up the pickoff at second base and you cut the ball off and you throw it to me. I'll block home plate. Don't worry about that. So, I mean, of course he had Mark Belanger probably oh, yeah. shortstop. So you could do that. And Cal Ripken. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> This, no, this is great stuff. I would love to see what you've got put together because I, it, it's, you know what, as a scout, if you never sat back there and played the, the position, you don't know what it's like, you know, and most scouts, I mean, we all are, we're all good at what we probably played. You're better at it or um, evaluate better at certain positions. The catching position is the hardest to evaluate by far. I mean, you see more catchers, but by double A, they're no longer a catcher. They're a DH You'll get a lot of tips. Time. You'll get a lot of tips in the in the in these uh, pages. That it won't take you long to go through it. I think Good. you'll no, enjoy it. No, I look it. forward to it. I look uh, forward to it. Yeah. yeah. Please do. Right. Well, anyway, the only question <laughs> I have for you left on, on my list of questions was, um, you know, your your scouting. You know. When you came into scouting so many years ago, did you have somebody that you looked up to that was a good scout? How do you determine what is a good scout at the major league level? How do you personally look at that? Uh, do you know anybody that was really a good scout that you that you that you knew? Oh gosh, you yeah. And, um, when I started in '93, uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to get on. Our scouting, the scouting director for the Indians at the time, an eerie guy, uh, and a lot of clubs. I was coaching at a JUCO in Oklahoma, and he, Northeastern Oklahoma Junior College. And uh, several scouts were coming in to see uh, a kid by the name of I, – I'm from Toronto, Canada originally. So I'd go up there in the summer and bring a bunch of these Canadian – or not a bunch, but a handful of Canadian kids down. And we had three or four really good ones that year. And uh, the scouts were pouring in there to see uh, um, a kid by the name of Jason Dixon, who ended up pitching with the Angels for a while. Uh, D-I-C-K-S-O-N, right-hander, pitched yeah, like in... I know who he is, actually. Yeah, 95, 96, 97. Mm -hmm. Had a bunch of injuries after that. I think he made an all-star uh, game also in 96 or 7. But yeah, uh, he was there. So, a lot, yeah. Yeah, so that was my first introduction to even <laughs> knowing, you know, anything about scouting you, you saw them at the games once in a while but you know i got to know them they asked me a lot of questions about these kids so i got to spend the time and and visit with these guys and all of a sudden the scouting director said hey you know we don't have anyone in canada um you interested in scouting for the summertime in canada and i said he goes i'll give you like fifteen thousand bucks go up there and scout from one end of the country to the other do what you needed to do i don't even know how to i wouldn't even know how to start so I uh, went up there and I was doing camps by myself across the, the the provinces. I kid you not. And 
they would put an ad in the paper and I not I kid you, there'd be five, 600 kids show up. I'm, I'm the only one there to throw BP and I'm doing the full 60 yard dash, the in and out BP. And I'm throwing to like two or 300 kids, you know? Mm. And, uh, um, uh, we did that for most of the summer, but ha- uh, halfway through the summer, the scouting director called me and I was going to go back to the JUCO and he said, Hey, just want to let you know, I fired our scout in North Texas. Um, do you want the job? And <laughs> so I uh, literally packed my stuff and moved down to Fort Worth and, and opened shop and was the North Texas scout. That was in 93, 94. So that was my first year that year. Um, when I started the scouting, um, it was a lot different. Uh, you, you didn't, you, we didn't talk. I mean, I didn't, nobody came over and said hello. You didn't talk to anybody. Uh, you didn't um, share names. You didn't share information. Everyone was on their own. You know what I mean? They were all independent. There was no uh, um, socializing going on. You know, it was just straight up scouting and guys bearing down and doing their work and, getting different angles of the ballpark. Uh, you know, I didn't, uh, <laughs> it was hard to get to know them. You know what I'm saying at first? Then after a while, the guys started just, you know, say hello and visit with you and spend some more time and, and you'd run into them once in a while, but no, there was no, you know, we had no social media. We had nothing. No, we, uh, uh, you know, you just showed up. You may show up in West Texas to go see a kid playing. The game was canceled two days before, you know, after, when you mm. find out when you get there driving eight hours. But, um, um, no, totally, totally different. Probably one of the first guys who I really got to know was a guy named Joe Ford, who, uh, um, was with the Blue Jays at the time in, in Oklahoma. Um, you know, there was guys like Stan Meek was scouting then, um, with the, uh, with the Florida Marlins at the time. Um, there was a lot of really good, you know, once you got to know them, these were super people, uh, and most of them aren't in the game anymore. And, you know, I'm probably one of the older guys out there now. Um, uh, so, you know, over the course of the last 30 years, you know, now I'm in that position. So, um, yeah, the game's changed the way we evaluate. Um, there's a lot. Like, you go to a game now, an amateur game, and you're battling cameras and tripods set up and guys with high-speed stuff and all kinds of stuff. There's gadgets everywhere and and you're kind of in the middle of it, trying to sit behind the plate and evaluate. Um, so it, it's totally different than when, uh, you know, it's just the way it's evolutionized over the years. Years. Sure, sure. Well, what advice do you have for any player when they're aware that a scout or recruiters in the crowd, you know, what, how do they comport themselves on the field? What do they have to keep in mind? Other than obviously getting a couple base knocks or making some good plays, yeah. how can they get the recruiter or the scout's attention? Yeah, well, firstly, most of these kids now, hey, Kelly, these kids have been on that big stage of these big showcases for so many years that they're they're very comfortable in their own skin with um, in evaluators and scouts all around them, you know, because it's just the way it is now. There'll be 100 guys, 200 guys at showcases in Jupiter or uh, – the area codes and things like that. Um, these kids are just kind of used to it now. Uh, you know, the kids are like on the top end of the draft and the high profile type kids. Um, that's one thing I've really noticed. It doesn't seem to bother them. Um, but what I look for, I mean, guys that pay attention, you know, pay attention to detail, you know, they're engaged in the game, you know, uh, like a high school game, you know, I can wander from one end of the fence all the way around the other side. I'm keeping my eyes on the kid the entire time just to see how he is with his coaches, his teammates. Uh, you know, is he engaged? You know, uh, is the effort there? I mean, these are, uh, you know, we talk about the two things. We always say it's makeup. You know, hey, what's his makeup like? You know, I mean, I can fool anyone with your, my, my makeup, you know, but I don't think you can fool him with your character, you know? And that's why I try to separate the character from the makeup. What's this guy's character, you know? Um, his makeup is the guy, his makeup is more suited to like, he's the guy that wants to be up in the in the ninth inning, you know, with the tying or winning run on second base. And, you know, he gets, he drives the, he drives the guy in. That's the makeup in him, you know? But his character is, all those other things, which it's hard to kind of evaluate. So I think a lot of times I just kind of go with my gut feel off of 
uh, what this kid's all about. But I'm evaluate. I evaluate kids at my youngest, you know, basketball game or s- soccer game or softball. Everywhere you go, you're constantly evaluating every kid on the on the playing uh, court or surface. So <laughs> it just becomes embedded in your in your head. But um, now these kids are really comfortable now, I, I, and I find that you know they're they're, they're pretty mature. Um, at most of these events to, to, to what's going on around them. Um, they seem to be schooled up also. They all have advisors they've had for several years too. So um, if that answers your question. It, it does. Uh, here's another question that I think is on the forefront of a lot of prospects minds. And that would be baseline metrics. What baseline metrics need to be attained before a ball club will consider signing a player from an offensive standpoint? Not everybody can you know hit a ball or tries to hit a ball with a 98 mile per hour exit velo you certainly take a look at guys like steve kwan ichiro you know some of these uh smaller hitters who get on base all the time and have a very low strikeout rate you know they're they're not whacking the ball all that hard to go up it's just not necessary so where is the baseline you take a look at the guardians i'm kind of bloviating here but it's it's sort of a point to be made you look at the Guardians, they were the second winningest team after the All-Star break, and they didn't hit many home runs at all, but they hit the ball oppo, they bunted, they moved runners. They didn't all hit for a really high average, but it was really entertaining baseball. Certainly, the Cleveland Guardian uh, ownership is getting their money's worth. What's your take on that, and what are those metrics? You know, I and I'll be honest with you, I, I try not to dig too deep into what the baseline metrics are. You know, I'm we're schooled up a little bit in them, from our analytics department, but um, to be honest with you, it's 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 it would not be right for me to say exactly what they are because I don't know. Um, you know, I'm trying to just use the human eye and and evaluating whether it's this guy has bat speed or the guy has good exit velocity. Um, I'm still looking for those guys who are high barrel contact guys and swing at strikes, know the zone. Um, uh, lift is not important to me. I want to see guys that have good carry. Um, I try to still stay really traditionally with the things that I was brought up teach or learning as a scout, you know, that was, you know, guys who put the ball in play, um, drove them, drove the gaps, could make outfielders turn and run. I mean, just very simple stuff, you know? Um, and, and, we may be on the cutting edge, the Houston Astros and so many of these analytical approaches and, and data driven and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, um, we've been winning championships, doing all those small things. We strike out less than anyone else. Uh, we hit balls behind runners. Um, we put the ball in play. These guys compete in the box. We have a traditional closer, like no, not many clubs even have anymore. Yeah. Uh, I think we're one of the, Traditional and uh, obviously with Dusty, uh, there also we play as traditional style baseball as anybody, uh, from Bregman to the new the kid Pena at shortstop to Altuve and Aguriel and all the way around the horn. These guys get in that box and compete, and they compete on the other side of the ball on defense as good as anybody. We don't make mistakes, and we keep pressure on the defense. We still bags. Um, we're aggressive. In, the, in certain counts, uh, we have guys who really know how to manipulate the barrel and use the field. So I, I still think that the traditional style of baseball is what's winning championships. Outstanding. Rick, any parting thoughts? Well, no, that's just great. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm enlightened uh, talking to Jim because uh, he goes back to the old ways that we learned how to play the game fundamentally. And uh, what he's telling me is that's exactly what they're doing with the Houston Astros. Yeah, it's good to have the analytic to a certain extent. The information will 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 not tell you every single thing that goes on uh, on, on the baseball field. Uh, but that old style baseball that you're talking about, it does. It still wins a lot of ball games and it keeps the fans in the seats, which is a pretty important too, because it yeah. makes the game so much more interesting then it has become just from the analytical approach, what we hear just uppercut, uppercut and swing as hard as you can. It's okay. If you only hit 200 and 
what the heck, you know, it's not okay. <laughs> no. You're not going to win championship like that. No. No, no doubt. It's, uh, I, we were talking about before we came on here, Rick, I mean, we're a fun team to watch. Uh, um, and I think a lot of teams are going to start really copying or trying to, you know, do what we've done. And uh, we plug holes. We don't make wholesale changes. Uh, there's a plan in place from ownership down um, that we have a, and, you know, Jeff Bagwell's taken on a big role with us now too. And Enos Cabell and these guys, and um, they have certain things that we're going to stick with and continue, uh, you know, to keep competing for championships every year. Yeah. Um, while everyone else is, is, is zigging, we're going to, or zagging, we're going to keep, you know, doing what we're doing and what we've been successful with. Yeah. Well, Jim, yeah. thank you so thank you so much for joining us today. Continued success, and let's stay in touch, J gentlemen. Oh, sure. That's all the time we have for tonight. For all of us at the Prospect Blueprint, here's the quote of the week, and see if you guys could guess who this is. He was the man. The key to hitting for a high average is to relax, concentrate, and don't hit the ball to center. <laughs> high five ball to center field. I gave it away. Stay on mute. Gentlemen, have a, have a great holiday. From all of us to all of you, cheers. <laughs>